Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this year's Claude Ake Memorial Lecture. My name is Anders Temnier, and I'm the head of the Claude Ake Visiting Chair Committee. I'm also a senior researcher at the Department of Peace and Conflict Research here at Uppsala University and also the Nordic Africa Institute. The reason why we're gathered here today is to honor the memory of Professor Claude Ake, a renowned scholar and activist from Nigeria. Ake was one of the leading political economists and social scientists on the African continent. He dedicated his intellectual work and life to the social emancipation and empowerment of the African people. In particular, Ake was an outspoken critic against the authoritarian regime in Nigeria and in many other African countries. Ake was also a dear friend of Uppsala. He visited the Department of Peace and Conflict Research at Uppsala University and also the Nordic Africa Institute on several occasions. On this visit, he shared his visions of social emancipation, peace and democracy on the African continent. It was therefore with great grief that we received the news about his untimely passing in a plane crash in 1996. In order to honor Ake's legacy, Uppsala University and the Nordic Africa Institute, together with uh, sponsorship from the Swedish Foreign Department, created the Claude Ake Visiting Chair program in 2003. The chair is intended for scholars who, like Ake, combine a profound commitment to scholarship with a strong advocacy for social justice. It's with great honor that I present the 2017 holder of the Claude Ake Visiting Chair, Professor Rashid Tlemsani. Rashid is a renowned scholar working with topics such as democratization processes, nation building and state building in Africa. He has, among other things, published several books on these topics. He's also a, a very internationally renowned scholar who is often approached by international media and is also been a visiting scholar at prestigious academic centers such as Harvard and Georgetown universities, as well as the University of Paris. So obviously, we are very happy to have Rashid here with us. And Rashid is currently based at the University of Algiers, where he's come employed as professor in political science. A key challenge in many contemporary African societies is how to improve the daily livelihoods and socially, of socially and economically marginalized groups, such as youth, ethnic minorities, uh, poor women, groups like this. One of the strongest findings in peace and conflict research is that economically vulnerable individuals are more prone to use arms. Of central importance, then, is how governing elites relate to these issues. They can either develop policies that emphasize economic and social justice, or create political system based on rents, corruption, and nepotism. The latter systems are extremely vulnerable to economic shocks and crises, which can easily degenerate into civil wars and riots. Rashid's research feeds into these questions and thereby closely contributes to Aki's vision of social justice on the African continent. So now we'll proceed in the following way. First, um, in just a minute, Rashid will give his presentation which is entitled Poverty and Elites in Africa Towards a New Thinking in an Era of Global Transformations. Thereafter, we have Dr. Henrik Angebrandt from the Nordic Africa Institute, who will give some reflections and thoughts on Rashid's presentation, and this will be a followed by a discussion between the two. After that, we'll obviously also open up for discussions from the audience and uh, who may have any questions. And also at the end, we will have the director of the Nordic Africa Institute, Ina Sori, who will give some closing remarks. So, Rashid, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Anders, for these kind and generous words. I would like also to thank, you know, Henrik for accepting or being, you know, a discussion of this lecture. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers of this you know, program, namely the DPCR, Department of Peace and Conflict Research at NAI, Nordic African Institute. And also I would like to thank particularly you know, people who worked very hard to bring you know, for several months you know, scholars from, from Africa in Sweden, a beautiful country. That's the first time that I discovered you know, uh, the North Nordic, you know, country that uh, really, I'm amazed, to be honest with you, about uh, the political system. 
which is more, which is a lot, you know, egalitarian, you know, on, on uh, issues, you know. I think, I, I, I think, uh, I would say it is a really socialist country, you know, a really positive sense, in the sense, you know, social inequalities are not huge, as we have in our country, in, in Africa, you know. Uh, some people who visit Africa, you know, knows, you know, the, the question of, of social in, in inequalities. So, and also I am very happy to be this, this country, the country of Olof Palm. A lot of people have forget who, who was this great diplomatic and politicians, you know, uh, personalities. I think uh, and he helped a really lot the liberation movement in Africa and others, country namely in Vietnam. So for me, he's more or less my generations, you know, um, um, uh, uh, we should pay tribute to him any time because, you know, he did a really, really great. And also at the local level, also he worked very hard to ease, ease the social inequalities. And this, you know, this, uh, the, this, you know, give us, you know, strength to our fight against the neopolitics situation. Some people ask me why I pick up the, the word or the concept of poverty in my, in my lecture. This was the heart, as you know, under mentioned of, of the professor Claude A. Kino you know, philosophy. He was, you know, a fighter for social justice in his country and he, in his, you know, um, 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 con uh, in his country, in his, you know, all Africa because of his teaching, his writing, and his, his, uh, his uh, humani humanism. So to come back to, the, to my talk, the suggestion, you know, title is Poverty and Development in Africa Toward New Thinking in the area of global transformations. What uh, I would like to, uh, to say, I try to answer one simple question. Why Africa has felt its path of development? That is uh, the question that I try uh, to answer. In, this, in, in the early 70s, you know, what is his name? Ganar Miriad, the 1974 Nobel laureate in economics, make a really good remark. He said, you know, the Asian countries such as South Africa, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore, you know, were to some extent at the same level of development as, as a lot of Africans. Although Af African, you know, countries have a lot of, you know, resources, natural resources and human resources. So 50 years later, or six or 55, something like that, you know, Africa stayed in underdeveloped, while these countries have emerged as economic and regional power, although they are really, really poor. And uh, what was wrong? To answer these questions, you know, we have lost theories. One of them, you know, said, you know, Africa didn't develop because of DNA. There's something wrong in its, in its uh, genes. It is kind of, you know, uh, some, you know, racist, you know, theory developed this. Matter, I think this development, what would say some people, development of underdevelopment in Africa, I think, it, I think is linked the pattern of development, to the paradigm that has been chosen on the, on the next day of independence. To do so, I will leave away myself the colonial past. My here, because and myself, I will be a very provocative, provocative person. I think the, the colonial past doesn't have you know, strong relationship with the current situation in Africa. It has in some way, you know, kind of relationship, but, but it is not a really in, in, in strong, you know, on, uh, connections. So I think, I think the, the problem is with us. As, you know, Jean-Paul Sartre, French philosopher said, l'enfer c'est les autres. 
Hell, hell is the other people. That, that is uh, the, the main, there is uh, the main assumption in the literature of uh, Africa, you know. There is running assumption, you know, S said, said, you know, the past, uh, the, the constitution is linked with colonial rule. I think, I think it, after 60 or 50 years of independence, I think it's too much to put all the blame on, on, on colonial rule. Just uh, to recall, you know, Europe, the reconstruction of Europe took only five years. In five years, with a little bit help from the uh, United States called, you know, Marshall Plan, which was at that time, you know, 11, you know, uh, billions to some, to the current, you know, money, we would say, you no know, one, one ten, you know, uh, billions. Europe recovered in, uh, in five years. Africa in 50 years, it, it, it is getting, you know, Oh, very poor. Poverty ha has not been reduced. On the contrary, you know, if, if you take, you know, the last report in the United States, it, it, it was uh, uh, published just uh, 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 last week, you know. Malnutrition poverty has increased by, by 50% in, in 2015, you know. I think it, 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 it is terrible. So I, I will, uh, as I said, I will uh, argue in a in very holistic you know, way. I, I will try to be very, very broad to be in, uh, analytical. So in this perspective, I will, I will, I will investigate, investigate you know, five you know, main features of this, of this economic you know, model. These are, you know, natural resources, economic, uh, economic liberalization, land grabbing, corruptions, and democratization. So the whole model of, the, of development is, I, is, is organized winning these five main themes. To start with, for natural resources, let me give you some uh, gross data about natural uh, resources, you know. At the independence, you know, African leaders said, you know, we are going to develop, we have a lot of hopes, we have a lot of you know, natural resources, so it will be very easy. And, and it is true, the continent, you know, account for 30% of mineral resources, 45% of gold, 90% of uh, world planetium, and so on and so on. So Africa, at the, uh, with the independent, had the opportunity to take off because they have a lot of resources. We forget you know, um, the, the human resources. Uh, uh, the, we forget only, only from the material perspective, you know, uh, Africa could, could er eradicate you know, poverty. But what we noticed, after a few years, in the, in the late 70s, we noticed that, you know, the elites, look, I mean, socialist or liberal, you know, or ideology, you know, has reached the conclusion that, you know, the, the, the fiscal crisis is very high, the, uh, the economic growth is very low, compared to the growth of population, and so on. Lots of countries, you know, were on the brink of, of bankruptcy. So to, to save their country, they knocked to the door to World Bank and uh, International Monetary Fund. They said, please, you know, could you help us? And they said, no problem, we will help you. But in their own conditions, you have to follow our paradigm. We should you know, put you know, um, a radical reform in your economics. If, if you want, you know, um, I help you. This economic reform called you know, in the media called you know, neoliberal politics. Uh, and also, it is, uh, it is known by, by, by the um, ASP. Adjustment structural programs. These programs are based on four main ideas. 
The first one called, you know, liberalization. What does it mean? What is it supposed to mean? It means, you know, the promotion of free movement, of capital, the opening up, you know, a local market to foreign commodities. The second element is privatization of public service and, and company. It means, you know, the public firms should be sold to people at the very symbolic, you know, dollars or whatever. And the question is, you know, most uh, also people who, who bought these, you know, factories, these, you know, firms belong to the elite, to the ruling group. And this privatization has been done very in secrecy. It was very opaque situation. Nobody knows. The third conditions called, you know, deregulation of labor relations and safety net. What is supposed to mean deregulation of labor relations? It means no labor union in, in the factories. It means, in other words, when international capital wants to invest in any country, says, you know, we, we, we should not have you know, labor unions because we we'll have uh, strikes. So we'll have, you know, on uh, the, uh, the, the, the wild strike will, uh, will hurt, you know, um, uh, the program of, of the manager. But at the another level, we know very well that cap development of capitalism was done with, with, with the, the collaboration of labor unions. Capitalism did not develop without labor. Labor organization without, you know, uh, 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 labor union. But, you know, in Africa, this, you know, new ideology said, you know, we don't need, you know, labor, you know, organization. For, forget it. And uh, the fourth one is, we call, you know, the currency devaluation. What is it supposed to mean? It means, you know, the local products cannot be, cannot compete with foreign products with foreign commodities. Since they cannot uh, compete so, they are not sold. So the factory has have, uh, have the, to close. To close, they have to lay off you know, of workers. And, the, and these workers, you know, um, uh, have to he, had, uh, had, uh, have, you know, to do something else to steal or to be, you know, or more robbers or to be jihadists or to be, I don't know, of, of, of to try to, um, to, to go another country or whatever. So after uh, three or four decades of this, you know, program, we notice that, you know, um, uh, we notice infra-African trade did not, uh, uh, did not progress, did not increase. It is a, uh, actually decreased, it is around you know, 3%, 3% uh, only. At, and at the level of world level, you know, the, the Africa represents about you know, 3% of the global trade. And the, uh, the ideology of, uh, the officially ideology said, you know, Africa, if, if Africa implement this, you know, new market theory, it will be more integrated in the world economy, which is not uh, true. It has been uh, uh, more marginalized. So ha has the social consequences of this, you know, uh, what we have? We have, we have you know, people have, have to pay for basic social service because of this new liberal economics. Everything has, has to be paid. And we have cuts in education, in, in health, and so on. People who do not live in this country will have a hard time to understand what is the meaning of cutting, cutting down you know, on the education and the health you know, or, or programs. It means you know, um, people cannot go to school. That is, uh, uh, for instance, in some uh, family, when the budget is very low, if they have almost two kids, one boy, the other girls, they, they have to send, for instance, one, one kid at school. 
Do you know who will go to, to school? The boy. The girl has to stay home. And this contradicts, you know, the, the discourse of the international, international community. International community said, you know, a lot of NGOs said we are helping, you know, gender, human liberation, blah, 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 blah. But, uh, but uh, at the real level, we see how women, how girls don't ha have a chance to go to school. So to survive, they have to do a lot of things in the, in the informal economy, as we will see later on. There is another, another thing uh, is very crucial that happened in, in, in Africa, you know, with, uh, with the international uh, crisis in 2008. From this date, we have noticed that, you know, international capital is buying, you know, land in Africa. We call it, you know, they don't use, you know, buying the term. They use, you know, grabbing or leasing land. But when they lease land for 100 years or 200 years, it means buying. But uh, they don't have, the elites don't have you know, the political courage to say, no, oh, we, we, have, we, have, uh, we have to sell uh, this, uh, this, this land. So people uh, are interested in buying land in Africa for two reasons. One, the land is really good. The second one is, is very cheap. And all these deals are, are made very you no know, obscurity, you know, in secrecy, you know, um, and this kind of deal, you know, fuel corruptions. And uh, what is uh, the what is the rationale of of, of leasing this land? This land said, you know, the elite said, you know, the yield is very low; it is less than twenty percent. So uh, we are very poor. The state cannot, you know, increase, you know, uh, the crops. We don't have technology. So we'll invite, you know, international capital. He will bring, you know, technology. Then he will bring, you know, a lot of money uh, for cash to the state. So we will solve uh, uh, radically, you know, this issue. What happened in, in, in the reality? In the reality, you know, this deal was, was done on secrecy and the total opacity, nobody, nobody knows. And this, yeah, the international capital used to use very sophisticated technology. So they don't hire a lot of manpower. The, uh, the, the people, the, the job that they create are very in a part-time job, very seasonal job. So, so uh, the issue of uh, solving the, the question of unemployment does not hold at, uh, at all. And more importantly, the crops are exported abroad. I give you an example. The first crop of, of the rice from uh, Saudi Arabia in Ethiopia was sent uh, in Saudi Arabia. At the same time, Ethiopia um, uh, got, uh, got uh, food help for five million of people. People were dying in Ethiopia while the, the crops was sent abroad. What, uh, what was the gain from this you know, phenomenon? Only a group of people get some, uh, some corruption. <laughs> That's it. And, uh, and what is the worst of it, you know, the state, you know, can, can lease this on the assumption that there is no title of property. People don't have a property title. So, de facto, the, the state said, these lands belong to me. So, all of a sudden, uh, the peasants find you know, fences on, on their land. Because uh, their land, they work their land for generation and generation. All of a sudden, they find removed from, from their land. They are pushed on the desert. So we create you know, more, more unemployment with this phenomenon. So the, the whole question of uh, leasing, you know, 
land doesn't solve the problem of food in Africa. I think that the solution should be something in, that is not in fashion now, land reform. I think land reform should be the solution for malnutrition. But this land reform should be activated by the youth. If the youth are not you know, involved in this process, you know, it will be failure. If, the, if this uh, land reform or green revolution is put into practice, I think it will, it will uh, solve the problem of unemployment, the problem of, of uh, food. You, the youth will stay in their land. They don't try to go adventure, to, to, to go to Europe or whatever, or to North country. It will, it will solve a lot, a lot of problems. But, but the, the question of, uh, of land and the reform is not at all, you know, on, on, uh, on, the, on the agenda. It was actually, it was backward. When, when people refer to land reform, you see these people are very traditional, they are very uh, uh, backward. So all this, you know, land, you know, um, has, you know, increased informal economy in opposition to what, what uh, the official discourse, you know, has been professing. So the, the informal economy called, you know, also, you know, black market, you know, underground economy. There is a lot, you know, um, words and, and concept uh, for that. In Africa, wherever you, uh, wherever you go, you send, you know, Africa is, is become a huge, huge, huge bazaar, you know. Everybody is selling something, uh, something or, say, or buying, buying uh, uh, something. But the, the, the question of informal economy, I think, is, is very complex. I think it, it helps to activate, to some extent, the whole economy. For instance, even in countries where you know, uh, economic growth is very high, the jobs created are in the informal economy. Informal you know, economy has created you know, eight jobs of the of, of, of 10, you know. Most of the jobs are created in, in the informal economy. What is the meaning of informal economy? It means, you know, a business that does not pay, uh, that does not pay taxes, a business that doesn't get, you know, help f from the bank. Some people try to make uh, the, their living. In, instead of, of stealing, the, they make their, their living. The problem is, you know, um, uh, um, uh, they don't pay tax. But if the question is how, instead of repressing this, you know, informal economy, it would be much smarter to help them, to give them, um, to give them uh, uh, bank help, micro credits, or then people, I am sure, they will be more than happy to pay uh, taxes, you know. Um, uh, and in this, you know, informal economy, women are playing a great role. At home, they do a lot of crafts, a lot of, a lot of, uh, of the business. So it is not bad, I guess. I think without an informal economy, this country will disappear. Because in, to some extent, they are balancing, they are giving you know, sense to this you know, economy. And finally, we reached a stage you know, where the, the, the formal economy has become the official economy. The state, you know, adjusts itself according to the, to the forces in this, you know, um, e e e economy. But uh, the problem, uh, one of the crucial problems of this informal economy, people are, uh, do not benefit from social security, from health care. They, uh, they don't have any, any benefit. I think, I think the state should, you know, do something and... Uh, uh, to help uh, to help uh, this uh, these people because the informal economy is here is going to stay we have to be realistic the question how the state can regulate give you know um, and help these people i don't know well, what is wrong to help you know women that do a lot of work uh, at home what they need and some you know money some help 
from the bank and, uh, and uh, they, pay, they pay back. We have some, uh, some experience in India. For instance, the, uh, the, the issue of a um, uh, micro uh, economy, it works uh, nicely. On the contrary, in, in Africa, the, the, they try to, to represent. I think uh, they should find, uh, find a way. For instance, uh, we have noticed uh, with the just you know, phone, cell phone, you know, uh, some African can do really good, good business. And so to, to show that pe people are very, are very active, they can do a business if they get, you know, um, sol uh, so, some help. And also it will, uh, it will push people to stay in the rural area with, with land reform and, and with, uh, with the other, you know, um, uh, financial heap. What I am saying with this, you know, on, uh, uh, with this main feature of uh, Neoliberal politics, each feature can be you know, ameliorated. From this, you know, we can build in the future you know, uh, a new thinking, a new um, way uh, uh, of building in Africa. That, uh, that's uh, what uh, we, we are. Myself, I, I'm not trying to, uh, to destroy everything. No, what has been done, we can see the weakness of this, and we can bring you know, a lot of things you know, to move over, over forward. But, uh, but uh, the, the ruling you know, elites are not interested in that. For them, they just try to use you know, the state for private you know, business, for private you know, or, or profits. Uh, that, that is why, you know, from corruption has become a you know, global phenomenon in the whole world. It seems, you know, that you know, on, uh, corruption is hitting, you know, rich and poor countries. Its causes and effects are 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 really huge. And according to some people, you know, that there is uh, we cannot fight corruption because it is kind of human nature. Forget it. Don't make any effort to fight it. You know, just just uh, um, uh, relax. That is, you know, uh, the main uh, and the discourse that we can uh, we can find in the in the media. So I think this ideology, this theory is, is more more is more you know ideological than factual. As uh, we know, we have you know governments. Uh, some governments are more corrupt th than others. We have you know some. People are more corrupted than, than others. So, so corruption is not natural. I think uh, uh, we should punish individuals and institutions that are involved in this, in this issue. But you know, since a you know, uh, few, few years ago, we have you know, uh, Panama Paper uh, links and others. Recently, the what you, paradise, you know, or papers. What what the conclusion is? I think it, it is fantastic. The problem is is that you know multinational corporations and some uh, big men that have a lot of money in business, in entertainment, in sport, and so on. You know, they don't pay tax. This, uh, this uh, uh, paper uh, uh, links, you know, reveals that people do not pay, pay tax at all. But on the other hand, when uh, ordinary people try to, to cheat a little bit, you know, uh, they can, uh, he can be, <laughs> can be put in jail. <laughs> I, think, uh, the, uh, uh, I think there is uh, something, something wrong. When corruption you know, has become the elite sport, Everybody is, is, is running to get, you know. And uh, Obama uh, said something very interesting with, uh, with the Panama Papers, you know. He said, you know, the problem, is, uh, the problem is that a lot of this stuff is legal. It's not, it is not illegal. You know, people cheat legally. Rich people cheat legally. I think, I think uh, uh, it, is, uh, it is terrible. I think people who had, you know, I think the, the whole uh, international system, you know, has lost a lot of its, you know, legitimacy. 
the whole corruption is systematic issue. First, let me give you the last gross data I know. Do you know that 10% of the global GDP is in offshore you know, banks? This 10%, it, it, it represents, you know, the whole GDP of France and Germany together. It is on the uh, offshore, you know, bank. On the, or uh, as another comparison, this, you know, it is less than the, less than the Africa GDP. Africa GDP is more or less the French, you know, um, 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 GDP. So you said at least, you know, two times, you know, the, the GDP of the whole Africa is in the offshore, you know, or, or, or banks. And uh, we, uh, or we know, you know, these, you know, papers, you know, mentioned, of course, mentioned uh, some uh, African countries, you know, um, just a... Uh, 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 just uh, to, to tell, you know, this, uh, we have you know, Africans, you know, that are, you know, on, uh, they have uh, money in the tax havens. It is not, uh, because some people said, you know, it is a Western uh, issue. No, it is not Western issue. It is, it is the issue of the whole world, the whole, whole economic, you know, on, on business, you know, on, uh, that is, uh, is uh, the whole uh, issue. So the, this capital flight to Africa is getting a really serious problem. Let's give you some data to illustrate that, you know. From between uh, 1970 and 2008, the capital flight of Africa was estimated at 850 billion, 850. This, if for we take, we make some uh, computer, you know, calculus, If we take from this, you know, what you call for foreign direct investment, which is around six billions. If we take also away a uh, international, you know, aid to Africa, and also if we take away uh, the the remittances from diaspora, which is around, you know, 50 to 70 billions. So it will remain, you know, around 60 billions that are leaving Africa every year. 60 billions. In another way, in another way you know, Africa is helping the world. And by, by and large, you know, um, the flow of money is going south-north. According to all data that we have, you know, um, uh, the money is moving from south to north. We have the, 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 the media speech, you know, the, the money is going north to south. I, I think it's true. For instance, let me give you um, uh, some, uh, some data about for instance, the, uh, the brand, Geren. For instance, do you know that uh, from in France, there are around uh, 10,000 of medical physicians from uh, North Africa. 10,000. And these people were, were trained in Algeria and in Morocco and Tunisia. They were not trained in, in France, you know. Um, the states paid a real lot of money through austerities, the policy of austerity to, uh, to train these, these physicians, and they go to Europe. If and at the same time, what is really a terrible hospital in, uh, in, in North Africa are empty. We don't have the physicians. Oh, oh. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I, I think we should reverse the dialectic, you know, that the North is helping, you know, the South. I think we have to be a little bit careful. And, and here we have uh, two bad people who are, in, who are involved in, in quantitative if, if, uh, analysis don't do this, this kind of, of research. Too bad, you know. I think it will reveal a, a lot of things, you know. So, 
So the, the, this, you know, well, this corruption is, uh, is you know, is playing a really direct impact on, on the social structure, on, on the income distribution. What we have in Africa, we have more or less around 10% of the populations that, that captures, just take, you know, around 60% of the national income. 10% of the people take 60% of the gross national income. That, that, that is a result, direct, direct result of the corruptions. The corruption, uh, uh, which is terrible, you know, is threatening, you know, the issue of democracy, even in the Western society. That is, uh, 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 that is uh, the most, uh, uh, Crucial. I think it is, it is, it is very important to, to tackle the, this issue. To go to, to the last uh, point about democratization, uh, that is uh, the most important thing which is linked in some way in political corruption. We all know that you know, the third wave of democratization started in East of Europe in the 70s and then moved to Latin America in the 80s, then in the 90s in Africa. In East of Europe and Latin America, the transitions, democratic transitions, transitions has been a great success, except in, in, in Africa. In Africa, on the contrary, this process of elections, you know, led to the to the consolidation of authoritarianism. That is uh, through, through elections, of course there is manipulation, fraud and so on, on the big man, you know, stayed in, in power. And there, there are a lot of, of uh, devices, you know, that, uh, that uh, were uh, used. I tell you so, someone funny, you know, about the cutting co communications. That, that is funny, I have to tell you that, you know. During the, the Egyptian revolution, we have, you know, mystical place called Tahrir. People get in a meeting uh, every day over there. One day, the ruler, Mu Rais uh, Mubarak, said, you know, we are, we, I will cut, you know, communication. I will cut internet. And then people stay, will stay home. On the contrary, when he cut down the internet, people went all down you know, uh, this place, uh, Tahrir, you know. So we have the, the biggest Process, protest one was this day. Over two million of people were in the street. Just to show you how, how these big men are not uh, quite often smart. <laughs> so uh, as conclusion of this, uh, of this uh, movement of uh, demonstration, we Africa, we have two dynasties. One, dynasty of 50 years you know, in, in, in power. One in Gabon, Gabon one in Pogo. And, and we have, for instance, you know, five prisons that, that are, you know, in power for 30 years. Equator, Guinea, and Zimbabwe with him, uh, 37. I think he, he left uh, 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 last week, you know. But he, he left, you have to understand, you know, as a result, or the pressure of the street. That's a, 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 another, uh, another he, he issue. Because, you know, in Africa, in Third World, wherever, uh, people are moving. And uh, the, the, uh, are moving forward. That's, uh, that's what I call the big, you know, hope in the, in the future. Pe because in our society, are not stable. In the sense, they are not stagnant. They are moving in forward. And uh, the change will come from this, you know, people. So in, in conclusion uh, about this, this issue, I think autocrats have dominating, you know, the whole political system in, uh, in Africa. So we can say, you know, uh, democratic, you know, democracy has, has been failed. I mean, political democracy has failed in Africa because we are autocrats. The, the, the issue why, why it has failed, 
I think, I think uh, at the theoretical level, this kind of pattern, political pattern does not fit really in Africa. We should find another form of democracy that, is, that, uh, that, that integrates you know, um, traditions and, and the local cultures. As conclusion, I would say one thing, that uh, to take off, I think we should, you know, demilitarize politics. We should decriminalize, decriminalize, come on, say that, decriminalize, decriminalize you know, politics. That is, uh, that is uh, the, the crucial uh, issue. And we should wage, you know, war on poverty, not war on terrorism. I give you an example. In uh, 2016, you know, more than six billion, six millions of people across the world died of, of uh, malnutrition. At the same time, um, this year we have, you know, 30,000 of people died from uh, terrorism, although it has increased, you know, on, on uh, uh, 60 percent this year. So, um, the issue of uh, of uh, poverty should be at the heart of any politics. So the, the second issue, and here I, I completely agree with uh, Ashin Membe that, that he will give talks, I think, 6 December. Ashin Membe, I think, for me, he is uh, one of the greatest you know, philosophers in the whole world. You know? I think uh, well, uh, we, everybody should, should, should read. I think what he said, he said, you know, uh, we should open our borders. He said, you know, Africa, uh, he said, Europe, close its borders, Africa should open its borders. You know, in Africa we have more than 250, 250 borders. And we know Africa in the past people were moving, were moving from one place to another, doing business, doing trade and, 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 so, and so on. Now, as I said a while ago, with the, the movement, uh, we, we have movement, social movement in Africa. It is very strong. It has its weakness. It doesn't have you know, um, leadership because leadership has been you know, co-opted by the ruling uh, group. But, but in, in a while, I think we'll have, we'll have you know, uh, um, a new leader. And this you know, new movement, we will break down what I call the nation state. The nation, nation state that we have inherited from the past, I think it, we, it is over in the future. Not only in Africa, I think even in Europe. In Europe, I think uh, we'll have you know, uh, one, uh, 187 you know, community or, or whatever. But in Africa, I don't know how, how many we have. You know, the, the borders inherited from colonial rule, artificial borders will be, will be over. We'll have a new form, new configuration of state and nation. I think you know, from now on, we'll have you know, nation building. In the past, we have you know, state building. And state building wa was built on the repressive you know, apparatuses. Because we have you know, now a strong movement, grassroots movement, this state apparatus does not hold. Because the pressure is very, very hard, it breaks down. Then, then we say you know, failed state or poor state uh, and, and so on. Because the pressure is, is very, very hard. So in the future, I think, I think in the long term, we have a new configuration. We do not have you know, nation state that we inherited from, from, the, from the 18th century. I think it is, it is, it is over. So the last word, as Gramsci would say, you know, what we have, we have the pessimism of diagnosis, but we have the optimism of prescriptions, the optimism of the will, the political will. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Rashid, for your insightful presentation. Uh, I now give the word to Henrik um, to invite him up here to sit next to Rashid. I'm sure Henrik had some reflections and comments on Rashid's presentation, and you can have a nice discussion here. Thank you.
Thank you uh, very, very much for this uh, interesting uh, lecture who brought up a wide range of uh, issues that are uh, relevant in, in uh, a variety of, of aspects. And I will uh, not try to cover them all, of course, but um, perhaps uh, reflect on a, on a few uh, issues uh, that, you have, uh, that you have raised. Um, and uh, starting perhaps with the, uh, where you started on, uh, on the legacy of uh, colonialism uh, and uh, the, perhaps on the conditions for uh, development and democratization um, that uh, I believe uh, what, what you illustrated very well in your uh, presentation was the ex external forces and the international environment uh, that has really been an active agent in the uh, development of, uh, of African politics and uh, economies. And I think that uh, perhaps we need to also reflect on the expectations of what kind of development and democratization that uh, that Africa is uh, striving for it has many times also been um, defined uh, by external uh, forces. And I think that uh, when we discuss um, the idea why Africa has failed to develop uh, in the way that we expected, we need also to, uh, um, to ask ourselves whose expectations and what kind of development that we, that we uh, had in mind. And, and in uh, many cases, it is the European model that, uh, that was the way for development. And, uh, and I think that the, uh, what we see uh, here is that the European experience uh, uh, are significantly different or, uh, than, the, um, than the African uh, conditions. Uh, for example, perhaps where, where you ended, and was how the states uh, were formed in, in Europe and for what purposes. And uh, not to romanticize the European state formation, of course, uh, that it was uh, uh, some kind of a participatory process in, in any way, but uh, it served the uh, interest of the national elites in a different uh, way than, um, than uh, many African countries, uh, where the primary interest was uh, uh, among external forces and the colonial uh, uh, powers. Uh, and as a consequence of this, uh, many states still struggling with the national question regarding uh, the basis for the, for the nation state, uh, who is included, who is ex excluded, and who should benefit from the, the development. Uh, and, and here the international context was, of course, very different, uh, both politically and economically. Uh, you illustrated this uh, very well in, uh, not least in the movement of capital, uh, the uh, deregulation of uh, financial, and, but also in the trade area, where uh, we see African countries today exporting the national resources, as you, uh, as you said, but. Uh, at the same time importing much of the uh, uh, goods that they um, uh, previously uh, had uh, sustained. Uh, for example, uh, rice, fish, um, uh, and also uh, processed national, na natural resources. A, a third factor is also uh, the civil society uh, that you briefly mentioned, that, but that I would like you to also reflect a little bit on uh, the, the protests and the demonstrations that, after all, is taking place in, in uh, many parts of, of Africa today and has become a movement. Uh, but the civil society is also fragmented uh, and divided on ethnic, regional, religious basis. Um, so the struggle is not only against the state, but also within civil society, where some actors are more civil than, than others, uh, so to speak. And, um, and the failure of the states uh, to legitimize themselves have also made people 
to be able to look for alternatives, um, uh, for example, uh, in the form of violent and extremist organizations uh, such as Boko Haram and uh, Al Shabaab and, and other uh, movements that idealize the pre colonial uh, past in many ways, also. But, but in all uh, states and also citizens, they uh, face multiple challenges uh, uh, that need to be addressed simultaneously. Uh, uh, and this, uh, this also puts some challenges on how, both for development but also for, for democratization um, of, of the states. And, and one, uh, and, and connecting this to the kind of expectations of, uh, of development, how can we democratize development? Uh, how can development uh, priorities uh, uh, be formulated by African citizens or citizens in the African uh, countries? Uh, uh, um, so, and, and I think that you, you picture a gloomy uh, picture uh, in, in many ways. But, but still we see uh, economic growth, for example, uh, that has been sustained for uh, decades on a, on a 6% uh, rate, uh, and, uh, but, but it, that it has not re rendered any structural changes in African economies. Um, it has largely been driven by increasing in commodity prices uh, but there is still poor infrastructure, um, lack of investment in human capital, and une uneven state capacity. So um, this also uh, connects to the to the also international uh, language of inclusive growth um, that uh, that the elites have, have uh, in many ways uh, failed. And I think that here is also where uh, where we see the lack of uh, democratic uh, uh, ideals. But uh, the third wave of, of democratization, as, as you uh, mentioned, came to Africa in the 1990s. Uh, but it was also at the time when uh, the structural adjustment programs uh, were introduced. And I think that we need to also recognize the conditions during which this, uh, the democratization phase uh, came, to, um, came to African countries, that it was, a, so to speak, a tough start for democratic, democratic institutions that had to, uh, uh, for, it, was, uh, it was mainly driven by uh, international actors. It was driven also in the context of social uh, and economic uh, and, uh, hardship and um, democracy came to be blamed for many of the uh, uh, or democratic regimes came to be blamed uh, for many of the um, uh, challenges uh, that were imposed on them um, and but it also meant that democratic institutions uh, were often led by autocratic rulers in order to legitimize themselves, uh, uh, but with little intent to practice democracy uh, in effect. Uh, so, at the same time, there were initial, initially high expectations of democracy, uh, that the dividends of democracy would manifest themselves uh, materially, uh, and that it, it would bring development uh, although um, whether right or wrong, um, um, democracy uh, came to be, uh, I would say that it's, it's been uh, uh, challenged on, on many fronts that is perhaps not, we should not expect it to deliver on, uh, so to speak. So, um, but, but still there are positive trends, uh, I would say, uh, uh, positive democratic trends. Um, uh, if, we, if we look uh, 
in the last uh, 30 years. One is that the, the end of military rule uh, as a legitimate form of government, government uh, that has, um, and the great difficulty in organizing and justifying coups. Uh, for example, coups today are not coups, as we saw uh, last week. Um, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not possible to, to, uh, to legitimize that kind of intervention. And we also have the spread of democratic institutions, um, such as multi-party democracy, media pluralism, and, and also alternation of power is occurring in many African countries, um, um, that the institutions themselves uh, uh, are sustained in, in uh, although the practice in many cases uh, leave a lot to, to wish for. But perhaps the most important uh, point is uh, what, what you raised about, uh, for example, in the Egyptian revolution on the mass protest and, uh, and demonstrations that has uh, become a legitimate form of political action in, in most countries. Um, we have seen it in uh, Burkina Faso, Senegal, uh, in Tunisia, and Egypt, uh, and we see it in, uh, in Togo at the moment, for, for example. And, and citizens organizing uh, themselves and uh, demanding uh, a change in government and a change in, in policies in, in, uh, in, in many ways. So, whereas African regimes employ a range of methods to uh, maintain their power, the toolbox is at the same time getting smaller in, in a sense. Um, uh, and popular mobilization have in has in many cases also resulted in successful cases such as uh, military regimes being overthrown and also more smaller victories perhaps, but equally important that the tenure prolongation is, 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 uh, is meeting more resistance uh, and so on. So, so uh, uh, what I would also uh, uh, would be interested to, to hear is, is to what are, under what conditions are these kinds of protests and mobilizations successful and when are the elites and the autocrats are uh, really challenged uh, by a popular uh, um, popular will and popular mobilization, and, and uh, how 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 possible is it to to see that kind of uh, trend in the future, uh, for example? And I think here that is uh, it's important that we. Um, um, that we see that democra democracy and democratic demands have the, have the potential to, to be the common ground that civil society actors can, can, uh, can rally around and that the, the, um, the failure of, of uh, the politi that you said that political democracy has failed in Africa but Perhaps it's, it's rather the process of democratization that has failed, uh, because democracy has never really gotten a chance uh, in, in many uh, cases. So, so we need to, to, to uh, separate democracy and the, uh, the type of uh, democratic institution and how they have been used in, in African uh, uh, countries. Um, so, um, and as, as a last question to you, it, it, it would also be interesting to, to hear more about what, where you ended on, on what are the alternative visions of democracy uh, for, in Africa? Um, how, can an, how can African democracy uh, be formulated and how can, they, uh, how can we see them in the future? as an alternative to the European-based model of, of liberal democracy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for these comments and questions that I really, uh, I like very much, you know. Well, I have to, the real answer to your question, you will find them on the paper that will be in, uh, in, uh, written and to be on, on the on the w w website, because of very, very, 
very good question here, you know, you brought all the, all the crucial issue, but let me focus on one specific issue. Uh, to start with the end, on the relationship between social movement and democratization. I said, and I repeat, that democratization has failed in Africa. I mean, Western democratization has been, has failed. It uh, doesn't mean that, that Africans are anti-democracy, no. We need, as uh, Ashin Mbembe, you know, argues, you know, a democracy that fits the, lo the local culture and structure and habits and so on. We have, you know, the Western democracy, we have, you know, kind of blueprint of Western democracy in our country. It has imported, as we import, you know, this, this bottle of, of oil or water or, or, or what. That is, that is a crucial uh, issue and Af African people are not dummy people. They can bring their own system, political system, and so on. On so far, it has not been done because of the elites. The, the local elites has deeper relationship, which has business relationship, with the external elite. We have now, you know, global elite that is, you know, uh, putting hostage the whole economic uh, system. Uh, uh, that is, uh, that is uh, the man, the man. Issue. Let's, let's take an example of the why Japan succeeded. Because Japan took, you know, the, the Western you know, technology, it has it integrated this Western technology in, in the local culture in a very, very smart way, you know. After a few years, you know, Japan emerged has a, has a great has a great power. We have, uh, in Africa, we can do that, and uh, Japan was very and very poor country. It has, you know, it has only water, you know, that's it. It hasn't done much, you know. Um, for instance, we have, we have uh, uh, to bear in mind why Europe succeeded in a few years, you know. Uh, Europe was uh, reconstructed, you know, why? In Africa, uh, we have a lot of things, because we have the wrong pattern of development from the very, 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 very beginning. And now with this, you know, uh, uh, with this, you know, what is positive about this process of democratization, it has opened the doors for protests. Now every community wants, you know, its own state, its own flag, its own army, its own seat, United Nations. It's only you know, Klashinkov or whatever, uh, uh, you know. So in the long run, I think the, the whole configuration that we have, it will be broken down. We'll have, you know, I am sure, you know, that, that's, uh, that's the, the movement. We have you know, a new state co configuration but because so far, elites have built, you know, state issue. They, they put all their energies in the state. Within this state, they, they have uh, tried to modernize the repressive state. If we take, if we, if we take, uh, how, if we take uh, how much the elites have spent in the military and security state from the, in the independence until now, it is huge, huge, huge moon. I think uh, we could have uh, built you know, um, a, a new almost society in, 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 in every place. So we have uh, this, you know, democratization has opened you know, the way for social protests. Now, what is most crucial, you know, people now go to the street. They are not afraid of the Muhabarat, of the intelligence service. The war, the war of uh, of fear has been broken and once for forever. We take, for, we take even, uh, even uh, what happened just uh, last week in uh, San Papua, you know, how, how this guy, you know, this old guy, you know, 39 years, as he is in power, in power for 37 years, you know, he ruined his country. He, he was pushed to resign because of the street. He made, he made a good deal with the elite, uh, instead of, of putting in jail, he made good deal 
with the edicts, he, he kept you know, his assets, his fortune, he has billions, he has property, he, he, you know, uh, uh, and also his wife and his family and so on. It was deal between you know, the, the elites. This guy should be put, uh, should be judged, he should be tried and, uh, for, for ruining his country. For uh, uh, Zimbabwe was a rich country. You know. Now, you know, more than 60% of the youth went out of the country. The youth, you know, um, um, has, has left the, uh, the, the, the country. Why? Because of, of this politics. So now, uh, the, that is great. I am not pessimistic, as some people may think. I am a very optimistic person because there is grassroots movement. But uh, it is new. This movement is new. It doesn't have a leader, leadership. That's it. Because people who are supposed to direct, to take in charge, this movement has been co-opted. By, by the ruling, by, by corruption, by corruption. But you know, in uh, in few years, you know, because of, of the work of biology, these people will, will disappear. You know, uh, the, the the old generation will, will disappear. Some will have new new leadership. Uh, that is the main. Well, this movement will be led by the new leadership. We'll have a new new elite, and this elite is very well educated. It doesn't have any link with with, with the colonial past. It doesn't have any link with national liberation. It is new. It has been formed with the, with the, with, with the school. With, it is, it is open-minded because of the internet, blah, 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 the whole technology, communication, and so on. It, it has a new mindset. It is not an authoritarian, uh, this new elite. And this elite will build new worldview. And my said, I am, I am very, very optimistic. Uh, uh, and uh, we'll have you know, new Africa. Africa is, is rising now. And uh, now people think that, that I am uh, Afro pessimist. I am not Afro pessimist. At the same time, I am not you know, uh, Afro optimist. I am realistic. <laughs> I take into great account the concrete reality, the, the objective factors that exist on the ground. And, and things, uh, things are. Well, listen. Wherever we go in Africa, people are in the street. That is a new phenomenon. I think political science should study this, you know. Uh, I think they should take into consideration this new film, and they can put it in variables and put it in, in computer or, or a mathematical you know, model or whatever, you know. I think it should, should take uh, in, in, into account. Uh, so, I am a very optimistic person. <laughs> But, but if uh, may, uh, if I may, uh, one anecdote. Uh, I was uh, when I was uh, going to extend uh, my visa while I was in uh, Nigeria uh, many years ago, and uh, during this exercise, it was a lot of uh, waiting involved. Um, uh, not surprisingly, but but I chatted with uh, one young man outside the immigration office. Uh, and he said he wanted to go into the politics uh, in the future. So I asked him what, uh, what party is he joining? Uh, he's, uh, and his, his response was, whoever is in power. Um, and, uh, and I think uh, it, it tells us something about that this new elite perhaps may not come from nowhere uh, because these structures are also, what we see now is having repercussions into the future and how, how people conceive of politics and the benefits of politics and, uh, and what can be done and not be done. Uh, and many of the democratic forces are still in civil society and, and see politics as a uh, cul-de-sac, more, more or less. But, uh, but, but still, there are positive forces in, in, in politics also. But, um, and, and I think that perhaps it's interesting here to, to, to reflect this in relation to, to the Arab Spring and the, uh, what kind of repercussions and uh, the, the legacy of what we can see from that uh, today. Because uh, talking ab again about expectations, uh, in the West uh, everyone had the belief that, okay, now it would be democracy, uh, 
um, in, uh, in, uh, in North Africa. Uh, but it, seemed, it turned out to be a more complex process than that. Um, everyone thought that once Mugabe is gone, democracy is waiting around the corner. Uh, but uh, uh, it seems like uh, that is perhaps not the case. Uh, you must have. Uh, and, and, <laughs> and, and perhaps we disagree that it's not, it was not because of the street protest, but it was perhaps more uh, an intervention for continuity than for change, I would say, uh, that the party um, is, uh, is, is claiming power. Um, and uh, the, it illustrates that the one-man rule is perhaps not always just one man, but it's a hierarchy and there's a system that is uh, harder to, to break down. But, um, but what, what do you see as the, um, the uh, uh, legacy here and the conditions for this new elite to, to yeah. take power? Thank you, that is a really good question. The difference between you and me, myself I try to see history in long term has, has a broader side, you know, la long durée. In long terms, you know, I think things are changing. And they are faster than we think. Take, uh, you mentioned the legacy, legacy of uh, Arab Spring. I think Arab Spring, people did not, did not you know, demand for democracy. They demand for dignity. The concept of dignity is very, very powerful. It is strong. It includes social justice. It includes, you know, um, um, uh, democracy. It includes, you know, job. It includes, you know, um, um, uh, le, uh, uh, gender, equality, uh, gender. It is one word, dignity. And people went to the street spontaneously without, you know, parties. And people are doing, you know, on uh, politics in different way. Politics in a classical way is over. Even in Europe, how many people are, are, are involved in classical parties? Nothing, no, no, almost nothing. The percentage is, is, is very low. How many people are in social democracy or, or, or in any part? Really, really, really low people, you know. But people are organizing themselves. We have a lot of NGOs, we have a lot of organizations informal. Informal, uh, they are doing in, in a, lot, uh, uh, a lot of things. So, uh, the movement is ahead. People, people are, um, are moving and we have new, for instance, we take a, about the Arab Spring. But all people said, you know, at the beginning they have a lot, a lot of optimism. Now people are uh, pessimists. No, I think, I think things are moving. If I, mean, I, say, I, I, I see a long way, People are in the street now. That because uh, the Arab society used to be very stagnant, they, they don't move. No, no, are moving. It, it, it is very, very, very crucial. And, and we have repercussion in, in Africa or whatever. And I think you, you talk about uh, 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 Mugabe. I think the street has played a, a crucial, crucial, crucial role. Or, 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 the, or to, to push him to, to um, um, resign. You uh, took uh, uh, what, what happened in, uh, uh, in Kenya. People are in the street. In many places, people are, are, in, are in the street. They are calling into question, and, and the, the elected people, the big men, they are putting into question the fraud. The election has been raised. I think uh, we should take a very long Perspective, and you take Arab, Arab thing, you, you, you have to bear in mind in what he called the international reaction was against the, the Arab Spring. It was at, on the surface, it was it was a chaos, it was a failure. But from another perspective, myself, if I see things things are, are moving wherever you you have you know people are organizing themselves. Uh, social society is moving, but not in in the Western society. People are organizing themselves. Okay, <laughs> so thank you. Or do you want to round off your last sentence? <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. I'm really sorry to have to interrupt that very interesting uh, debate. You're really getting into it.
Um, but we also want to give opportunity um, to the audience to have some questions. And for that, I have, we have you one there with a microphone who's going to help us and run around a bit. So what we'll do is we're going to take questions. Uh, I'm going to try to be moderator. We'll work our way this way around the room. So we already have a gentleman over here who's eager to have the first question. Uh, thank you for a very insightful talk. It was really interesting to hear. Um, I'm also very happy that you like coming to Uppsala and you like the place, but being a local from here, I am aware that the kind of narratives that you were speaking about, about how uh, uh, there's a belief that the global north is aiding the global south rather than the other way around. So my question is, uh, what kind of measures could, could we take in order to try to change that narrative? Because I think that's something that's really needed. Thank you. Do we have some more questions? We can take maybe a, a few questions. Um, thank you very much for your, the informative session that you have just given us. I just would like to pick your brain, maybe any of you, could you just elaborate or just say what your perceptions are of religion on the influence of the democratic structure and also the dispensation that we are currently in within Africa and the leadership? Can you say, Rashad, Rashid, one more question? Yeah. Okay, we'll take a gentleman over there. Um, thanks a lot um, for the lecture, it was very insightful. Usually when we speak about Africa, we only look at the timeline from the 1960s, from the decolonization to today. And when there is a change, there is a coup, or there is anything like what's happening in Zimbabwe or the Arab Spring, two or five years after, people you will usually say, oh, well, that failed. But when you look at the French Revolution, it didn't bring immediate change in the French society. And when you look at the American independence, it didn't bring um, immediate change because it's still had a civil war. Um, the same goes with the Russian Revolution or any revolution in history. So my question is, in the case of Africa, because the rest of the world is changing so fast, technology is enabling people, um, developed country to move faster, and also the global education system is helping the human capital to grow faster while Africa is stagnating. What are some of the models that have been studied um, that have worked in Asia or like in other African countries, in the case of Libya at the time of Gaddafi, that African countries could apply even without the help of the states since we know the elites is the problem here? Okay, yeah, okay, thank you. I will start with the last question. I think to speak about Africa, I think myself, I start from the independence. During the day of independence, we had you know, two models. One, federations by Nkrumah, which tried to, to put this in force, he didn't succeed. And we have the, the over majority of, of, of the groups that want you know, uh, to, to implement you know, colonial institutions. So, you have, you have, we have to understand how you know, these groups took over. They took over, in most cases, by the help of the colonial rules. Formal people you know, helped them. When, then, and what was, uh, and uh, for us, just to recall, you know, the Organization of African Unity, you know, its first meeting was, was held in, in Cairo, in 1963. One decision, one big decision was, you know, you know, to preserve borders inherited from colonial rule. And everybody was aware and that these borders are artificial. Everybody was aware. But people who, who took over, each group who took over, he wants you know, to keep it. To keep this land, to keep the, the, this, uh, this, uh, this territory, and every, every group tried to preserve these borders. 
how to preserve it? To build strong state. State, ha state has institutions that have legitimate use of violence. To do so, they developed uh, the ideology of, uh, of uh, bringing nation. Said, you know, we bring nation, all the people together. That, that is ideology. In reality, how can, you know, a family rule over for 50 years or 40 years what kind of nation? I don't think so that, 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 that the African state has been in, uh, ruled by people who struggle very hard for, to build a nation. No, to, to preserve the state, to preserve the borders. That is, uh, I think we have to reverse the whole dialectic. The whole pattern. Myself, I strongly argue that, you know, Africa has been building, you know, state, not a nation. But now, with the democratization movement, people, I mean community, are fighting very, very strongly to have their own, you know, uh, state. In the future, in a long way, of course, you know, Every community, uh, uh, many community will form you know, a nation, nation and their new configurations. At this stage, we'll have you know, a nation. But the nation, the concept of nation will be different. The, the concept of nation, hear it from the, from the 19th century or from the uh, uh, West Falling on you know, um, uh, treaties in, uh, in uh, 1648 is, is, is over. It was good for Europe and, until a certain uh, period. Even this concept of nation, of, of, of uh, classical concept of nation for, for Europe is not longer valid. It is not, is not uh, longer. We see what happened uh, to Spain. Recently, Spain, for instance, will have, I don't know, for six, uh, I guess, you know, um, kind of community. Belgium uh, will we, we have, uh, have two, for instance. According to some uh, of, uh, studies, you know, Europe will be made up of one, 187. And a community or, or nation or whatever, we have new figures. But in Africa, we don't have uh, the intellectual courage to start to think on this direction. We still a nationalist patriotism is still very, very, very strong. I think we should, we should, we should think. We should intellectual try to at least at theoretical the level think, think this way. My prediction is that we are going towards the direction. Either way, it will be in passive way through democratization or through violence. If it will be through violence the cost will be, social cost will be very, very happy. I think the intellectual, the scholars, has crucial role at least to open this discussion, discussion. It is, until now, it is taboo to speak about the reformulation of the concept of nation. What is the meaning of nation? What is the meaning of state? I think we have, uh, and you, uh, young generation, uh, 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 you have a lot of things uh, to do, more, more particularly in political science, in social science in, in general. I think uh, there is nothing wrong to discuss about new co configurations, to, to see how, how history, uh, history is, is moving. You know? I think myself, you know, I think we are moving toward this direction. But I, I wish to be a passive, though, the concept of democratization is very, is very crucial to have in fair and legitimate elections. It helps a lot. But so far, we don't have this. I said, all the elections in Africa has been rigged, has been uh, marked by, uh, by fraud. So it is very good. It is very crucial to struggle, at least to have as preconditions. If you have preconditions you know, um, of legitimate you know, rulers, I think it, it helps a really a lot. Thank you. Response to the other question? Yeah, that, that's, all, that's what I have to say. Okay. I try to summarize them. Yeah. Okay, so let's open up for some questions on this side. Okay, we have two questions over here. Three questions, actually, so we can begin with a lady there. 
Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, I liked that part when you talked of uh, democra uh, democra democratization uh, <coughs> from the West is not working for Africa. I also believe so. Because I think that very, every time we are talking about Africa, we are talking about Africa in the lenses of uh, Europe, uh, Europe in Africa, mo uh, rather than talking more of Africa in Africa. So for me, uh, my, my inspiration to the younger, the, uh, the younger generation of Africa who are coming to rule Africa, you should take inspiration from Africa uh, culture history, because that is the part which nobody touches. We don't talk about Africa culture. We are always talking about outside. And yet it is Africa uh, culture history, which is going to unite us, which is going to uh, make us look more into what is ours, how we do it, how it evolves. Thank you. Thank you very much for the lecture. My name is Julius, and I am a student at SLU, uh, the Swedish University of Agriculture Sciences. And I am also a fan of democracy, so to speak. And just to say that um, I do disagree with some of your points, in that uh, democracy has not really failed in Africa. I mean, I'd like to draw I mean, the point that Henrik also made. The mistakes that we've made as students of democracy or democratization is that as soon as a country leads some authoritarianism uh, and start to adopt um, some democratic processes, we term them to be democracy. But if you follow the history of democracy on the African continent, uh, which was just introduced in the 1990s, um, if you read much about the countries, you tend to know that these are not really, really democracy as the word democracy is. So I would like to ask you, if you speak of the failure of democracy in Africa, what democracy are you talking about? Is it electoral democracy or democracy as we understand it? Because democracy calls for accountability, it calls for various processes of transparency, but on the continent, a majority of our countries are going through electoral democracy. And then the second point I would like to mention is on a what condition, in terms of poverty, does democracy exacerbate uh, poverty? Uh, is it that poverty is entrenched, and then when democratization comes, I mean, poverty is on the continent. The last point I would like to make, uh, I think Herring did uh, mention it, I mean, what alternative form of government uh, do we need in Africa? Because I get somehow very confused uh, when we say, that's yeah, we, we need to return to the African historical culture, historical tradition. These are, yeah, things that did not work in the past. I mean, it's debatable. It did not work in the past from the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, until up to the 90s when democratization tried to liberalize the continent. So what do we really need in Africa that will work? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I, maybe two short interventions, then we can continue afterwards. Uh, Victor Adetula is my name, Nordic Africa Institute. I also happen to be a previous uh, Ake chair, and I also have privilege of working with Ake directly. And I wonder what Ake would have said if he were to be in the room. Uh, he spent a substantial part of his life looking at democracy and democratization. And his last, his last work before his demise tied to the feasibility of democracy in Africa. And Claudake eloquently put this, that democracy is not what one person will do for you. It has to be what comes from your own unique historical experience. And uh, if we look at that, the debate about what is democracy, what is democratization, what the model will be, will continue uh, among the academics. But the people themselves are rejecting the elitist construction of democracy. 
And what they want is governance that translates to effective delivery of public goods, where they can go to school, where they can have good health. And I think that is where we can now put the failure of the elite. Either we call it the globalized elite, the global elite, or the alignment of the southern elites or the northern elites. My second point, quick, is to point out that mass action or social action has always been part of the political culture of African society. So what we have now is not a recent trend. The protest we have now is not a recent trend. The protest was there in Nigeria Revolution, in Mozambique, and part of colonial West Africa. But the strong power of the colonial states stopped and inhibited that trend. And the military and authoritarian takeover in several African states continue with that. With the little space that came with the wave of democratization, we are beginning to experience. And what happened in North Africa, East Africa, and part of West Africa now, is an indication that the repressiveness of the state has come back, which again is the failure of neoliberal democracy, which Ake fought against theoretically and in his social activism. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. I, I really agree with you, you know. I think the whole discussion is centered on the concept of democracy. What is the meaning of democracy? As I, I said, you know, I said Western democracy. I mean by Western and democracy, elections. Because by and large, people associate, you know, elections to democracy. Elections are one element in the democracy. And even elections, we do, we do not have, you know, clear and uh, transparent elections. I mean, wherever you go, we have fraud. And in any way, even if we have uh, transparent elections, you know, we not have democracy because democracy that works in Africa should be horizontal. Vertical uh, democracy doesn't work. Vertical uh, democracy uh, will reinforce the power and the privileges of the, of the elite. But what we need in Africa, kind of you know, social democracy that, go, that goes on the horizontal. What's the meaning of democracy? Just you know, let people organize their life at the local level, that's it. We, we should try this at the local level, people organize uh, themselves, then you know, uh, some people will rise as, as a leader, then, then leader, leader in each you know, community, you know, they, will, uh, they will form um, the, the, the national uh, elite. But this you know, democracy will come from, uh, from the roots of the society, not you know, um, imported from abroad, for from Europe or Western society. We have to work, you know, we call it, you know, deliberative democracy. That, that, uh, that what we need. We, uh, we don't need, you know, um, uh, shared you know, institutions. You know, we know in every country in Africa, we have a lot of institutions, a lot, you know. Senate, Parliament, blah, blah, blah. Uh, we have foreign, each country have five or six uh, institutions to fight uh, against, you know, um, uh, corruption, for, for instance. And the corruption is going up, uh, up, uh, and up, uh, up, uh, because people have been appointed by, uh, by the big men. And uh, uh, the, we should, you know, um, uh, forget the issue of, of appointing, you know, um, uh, people, you know. You should people, you know, um, elect their local, all uh, representative. If you have, if we get this, so we have new dynamic. Myself, I strongly believe on the new dynamic, and I cannot predict where to lead. But, uh, but I trust uh, the local uh, dynamic because it is sincere. It will go very, very, very far. Just you know, get uh, uh, get on this. You know, then we should you know, bring bring you know, the the conditions to put you know, this local 
dynamic on, on, on the move on, on the move and people people are, are, are moving are moving I think Africans are moving Africa is on the move that's my strong idea it is not mine I took it from uh, Shilmambe and I completely <laughs> agree <laughs> with you thank you Hey everybody, um, we're coming to an end of this uh, very interesting discussion and lecture. And at this time, we'd like to give the word to the lady here who's trying to get past everyone, Amina um, Tsori, the director of Nordic African Institute, to give the closing words. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yes, we've come to the end of this year's Claude Ake uh, lecture. Mm -hmm. Um, pessimism as diagnostic, optimism as prescription. I think that's something which I learned today. Um, I, um, we have um, used the words Afro-pessimism, Afro-optimism, uh, we've uh, used the word realism. I think what we have learned today is that we have a uh, looked at the, the development of the social justice and democracy in the name of the, the Claude Ake, who, was, who gave the um, you know, uh, title for this uh, annual lecture and this scholarship. So that's what we have learned today. We have looked at um, the development of, of African continent. And now again, we've talked Africa in a very general terms. Uh, which I think we all know that uh, maybe the picture is a, a bit diverse when we start looking at the different um, countries in the continent and different communities. So uh, it is my pleasure to thank Rashid, uh, this year's uh, Claude Ake Chair. Um, I also would like to draw attention that this was the first time we had um, uh, Claude Ake Chair from North Africa. So uh, um, Rashid will always carry that legacy of being the first North African um, Claude Ake professor. That is, of course, um, an indication that we, the Nordic Africa Institute, and surely also the Peace and Conflict uh, Department at Uppsala University have taken the notions of Africa as a whole. Africa has become, the continent has become more and more united in many respects, um, as also today when I um, happen to note that the African Union and Europe European Union Summit is, is starting, actually, um, if it's not today, tomorrow, the people are gathering in Abidjan. One of the trend of this year in that summit is the fact that North Africa is going down south. So North African countries uh, have become much more interested in looking at the dynamics, what's happening in the continent. And uh, uh, so uh, equally, Nordic Africa Institute and the Peace and Conflict uh, Department have looked at how can we, uh, true to our mandate, uh, which is to, to study and analyze and spread knowledge on Africa, to take note of this new dynamics in the continent. So therefore, we are very happy that we managed to, to, to bring Rashid here this year. Um, it's not the one-off um, event, because also this year, the Nordic Africa Institute has done other activities, including North Africa. We have a Libua expert at the moment in our institute, which has already written some policy notes, uh, Mikael Eriksson. And we've also uh, reached our, or um, sort of, yeah, emerged our uh, study project on regional economic communities in Africa to North Africa. In Rabat earlier this year, together with our partners, we had an uh, event on looking at the Arab uh, Maghreb Union, uh, how they are faring in trying to uh, pacify and organize peaceful uh, post-conflict situations and assure peace in the continent. So yes, um, social justice, democracy, development, I think 
Um, another signi significant um, feature this year is also all of you. I'm very happy that we, we managed to attract such a fantastic audience. Um, we we always struggling with the timing of this event because we know you students and teachers are very busy with your exams. And we all sort of at the research institute getting a little bit tired of the very long autumn and the terrible darkness. Uh, so we're very happy that uh, you have uh, joined us this afternoon. And uh, I'm sure there were many more questions to be asked. Um, and uh, sorry for that. But you know where we are. Uh, you know where the Nordic Africa Institute is. If you don't, take a little brochure and uh, ask us. We are not far from here. We are always there to discuss with you more about these is issues of African development. Um, we would like to pay attention in the end, finally, that uh, the applications for next year's Claude Ake professorship are open until this Friday. Uh, so if you know anybody, or if you're yourself interested, please go back home and, and write your application now so that you can join this uh, uh, prestigious group of our Claude Ake professors. We have uh, two of them present here today, also Victor, our head of research. So you never know how far you get if you become a Claude Ake professor. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, especially for, for Andes, uh, for good cooperation, uh, making this possible that we continue. This was the 14th year of Claude Ake collaboration with Uppsala University. Thank you for Annika and uh, all the, the other colleagues who have um, uh, made this possible. And then I wouldn't do uh, justice if I didn't thank Rashid once again. Uh, he actually uh, not only served us here in, in Sweden, he also served the uh, interest of the Finnish community, Finland. He went for a grand tour he visited uh, three different uh, universities in Finland last week. And that's also a way how we want to do this work of ours. We are sharing our guests with those people who we know are interested in African development. So, Rashid, thank you for everything. And uh, we will be sad to lose you. But uh, we know you'll be coming back. And, yeah, we are on the move. Right. Yeah, in optimism. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.